Why is music so important for the church? It gives us a glimpse into the mind of God. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And today I am finally, at last, going to be adding an organ to this church of mine in the front. I've had a space to build an organ for so long, but I've delayed actually doing it because I haven't thought of a good design for one yet. But thanks to this server that I have now, I've seen other people make really cool organ designs with banners and they've inspired me to make one. And while I build the organ, I'm going to talk about church music, and specifically the spiritual power that music has to connect us to God. So, music is a topic that I've studied my entire life. I'm a musician, I play the viola, and right now in college, I'm not actually studying anything related to theology. I'm majoring in both music and mathematics. Now, some people, when they hear that, will say, like, oh, music and mathematics, those are very different things. You know, music is more STEM and mathematics is more the arts. But other people who seem to understand it better will say music and math, those things are deeply interconnected. And the latter group of people are correct. Music and math are deeply intertwined because they both show us the mind of God. What do I mean by that? Now, in the Middle Ages, music was not considered an art form. Music was considered a science, just as math was. In As time progressed, music became more about personal expression, so that's why music became more of an art form. And certainly, you can music, use music to express yourself, but in the Middle Ages, music was used to express the mind of God. And that's why the church made some of the, the greatest music, because people thought we should glorify God with our music. And that's why the Bible is all about singing songs to the Lord. There's an entire book of the Bible that's all literally all about songs. It's, it's the book of Psalms, which is one of my personal favorite books. And if you want some really cool music to listen to, there's something called the Genevan Psalter. Uh, because during the Calvinist Reformation, some of the Calvinists said that you should only sing psalms and no other music in church. And I don't personally agree with that, but still, it caused them to produce the Genevan Psalter, which is every psalm set to, like, Renaissance four-part harmony. But it's um, written simple enough that you can sing along to it, and it's some of the best music I've ever heard. I think it's awesome. I'm going to leave a link to the in that to the... I'm going to leave a link to that in the description. But now, why does music connect us to God? Why does music show us the mind of God? So, this idea has existed before Christian philosophers. Greek philosophers like Plato saw the significance of mathematics and music and saw why they're interconnected. I think Plato said something like, music is a moral law. So philosophers like Plato thought that mathematical concepts are things that are higher than our physical universe. They sort of transcend the physical universe, and things like numbers and geometric shapes, while they may express themselves in our universe, their source is someplace beyond the physical universe. Their source is in the mind of God. How do we know this? Well, because our universe is finite, but mathematical concepts are infinite because there's like an infinite number of numbers. You know, the number pi has infinite digits. So where do they come from then? They come from the mind of God. That is the source of all these mathematical, concept, mathematical concepts. How does that relate to music? Well, if you study music and music theory, literally everything about music is math. Like, what is a chord? A chord is different frequencies of sound lining up so that they fit together. Like, for two notes to be an octave apart, what that means is the wavelength of the higher note is twice as, is twice the uh, wave, no, the, sorry, the frequency of the higher note is double the frequency of the lower note, so the wavelengths line up, and that's why notes that are an octave apart sound the same to us, and notes that are a fifth apart, there's like the ratio of three to two, so it still lines up, and I think the um, notes that are a third apart, there's the ratio of like five to four, I believe. So if you put the first, the third, the fifth, and the octave together, you get a chord. And all of traditional music is structured around chords. So there's this mathematical harmony that is expressed in chords. 
Now, math is objectively beautiful because math is, as Galileo said, math is the language uh, which, with which God has written the universe. And that is, a, that is a very wise truth. Math is indeed the language which God has written the universe with. And music is a way of expressing the beauty of mathematics and, in doing so, expressing the beauty of the mind of God. Now, you can be amazed at the beauty of mathematics just by studying math. A lot of people hate math, but I'd say 99% of the reason that is is because schools do an absolutely dog crap job teaching math. But anyone who teaches a subject well is going to make people not hate it. There's this one um, physics professor I heard who said any teacher who makes physics seem boring is a criminal. And I agree. I think any teacher who makes math seem boring is, is a criminal because there is a great spiritual significance to both math and music. Math determines the structure of music, and music is how we express the beauty of math, and therefore the beauty of God's mind. But it, it goes even deeper than that, because there is a profoundly Christian way that music has been used historically. So, in basically all classical music, there's this idea of tense, tension and release, of dissonance and consonance. So in music, dissonance is when something sounds a bit uncomfortable, and consonance is when it sounds comfortable. So consonance is when the chords line up, like a, a pure major chord, that's consonance. Where notes that are like not necessarily part of a chord or part of a seventh chord, where some of the notes clash with, with each other, that's dissonance. And all the best composers, whether it's like Bach or Mozart or Haydn, and most of these composers were either devout Christians or the music techniques they used were deeply influenced by the church. So Christianity really invented what we know of as classical music. Even if not everyone directly involved was themselves a devout Christian, we still owe um, we still owe the the church for our for our music, the music that we enjoy, because the church basically invented classical music. I, or at least it laid the foundations for classical music. Okay, this is the design I'm going to use for my organ. I'm just going to do it like that, and then um, like that. Okay, so these stripes are kind of going to try and resemble the, the pipes of the organ, I think. So yeah, the why, why does it matter to have this tension and release? Well, because tension... And tension doesn't sound good necessarily to our ears, but if the tension resolves to a harmony, if the, the dissonance resolves to a consonance, it makes that consonance, it makes that harmony sound even more beautiful because it's almost like it's overcoming the tension that came before it. And that symbolizes the gospel. That symbolizes the whole Christian message. Like, the death of Christ was the worst event ever, but the res it brought about the resurrection of Christ, which was the best event ever. So, um, the gospel is all about evil being turned around for good, and I think that is symbolized in all of the best music that has, like, uncomfortable dissonant chords resolving to more comfortable consonant chords. Um, if you listen to, like, any sort of sacred choral music, you will see a lot of this. You'll see a lot of this dissonance resolving to consonants. However, in more modern classical music, I know it's kind of an oxymoron, but in more modern, like, instrumental and orchestral music, which, unless you study music, you probably haven't heard of, and the reason you haven't heard of it is because it's just really bad. Because once um, the modernism infl infiltrated the music world, a lot of modern composers employed dissonance, but without resolving to consonance. They just sort of left it that way. They sort of left it sounding uncomfortable because they were trying to deconstruct the previous Christian notion that all the dissonance needed to resolve to consonants, that all the um, music needed to have, like, a happy ending, so to speak. Even if the music was, like, in a minor key, even if the music sounded sad, um, it would still resolve in a consonant way. There was actually a big tradition in, like, um, early hymns of what's called a Picardy Third, a third is what determines whether or not a chord will be major or minor. Generally, major sounds happy and minor sounds sad. So a Picardy third is when you have a whole piece that's in a minor key. That makes it sound sad. But then it resolves to a major key. Um, so it's sort of like um, good defeating evil at the end, which is the whole Christian message. 
And the presence of the evil throughout our lives makes the good at the end that much better. That's kind of why God allows evil according to classical Christianity, so he can be glorified and triumphing over it. So that's why the um, that's why music can really communicate a Christian message and do so effectively. But it goes even it goes even further beyond that. Because simply the way in which music communicates the beauty of mathematics, what that does is it raises our minds to higher heavenly realities. For most of our lives, our minds are preoccupied with earthly things, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we're not Gnostics. We don't believe earthly things are bad. But in order to have some sort of connection with God, it's important for our minds to be raised to the higher heavenly things. Um, traditional Christianity has believed in what's called the transcendentals, goodness, truth, and beauty. Goodness, truth, and beauty are all connected, and they are all rooted in God's nature. And furthermore, classic Christianity basically agrees with Greek philosophy that we all have a rational soul. And the rational soul has the innate ability to instinctively and intuitively perceive goodness, truth, and beauty. And this is why I think modernism is so dangerous, the lies that modernism tells us. Because one of the things modernism says is that beauty is subjective. It's very common to hear people today say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And of course there is some subjective aspect of beauty. I mean, obviously, every man should think his own wife is the most beautiful woman on earth. I mean, obviously, if we're talking objectively, that not every single woman can be the most beautiful woman. But there is a place for subjective beauty, but that does not deny the existence of objective beauty. Like, I think anyone who tells me that beauty is completely subjective and it's all based on personal preference is lying to themselves. Because everyone knows that, like, a great gothic cathedral looks more objectively beautiful than an office building. And you can't always even scientifically explain why. I'm sure there are scientific explanations for why, but you don't need the science in order to instinctively perceive that something is more beautiful than something else. So our modern culture, which doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in the transcendentals. It doesn't believe that goodness, truth, and beauty are objective. Our modern culture says goodness is subjective because, you know, morality is subjective. Our modern culture says truth is subjective because, you know, a woman can be a man if, if she or they or Z wants to be. And our modern culture also says beauty is subjective, which is why our modern culture makes some of the most ugly things you've ever seen. Now, Christians, modern Christians, are very good at recognizing that goodness and truth are objective because we say God determines goodness and truth. And that's true. But it's not like God simply arbitrarily decides what's good and true. Goodness and truth is, it's more like it's determined by that which is in accordance with God's nature. So goodness and truth are defined by God, but they're defined by what's in accordance with God's nature. It's not completely arbitrary. But modern Christians still are not good at recognizing that beauty is objective. If you say beauty is objective, they're like, uh, I don't know about that. And that's why a lot of modern Christian music is horrible. Like, Christianity has the best musical tradition of any religion, but I think a lot of churches have done great spiritual harm to people by neglecting the great musical tradition that Christianity has. That's why I think contemporary worship music overall is bad. It's just bad musically speaking, even if the lyrics are good. The music itself is bad. And we have lost this notion as a culture that the music itself can be bad. We think, oh, as long as the message of the music is good, then you can't say anything bad about the music. Yes, I can. Because the music itself, I'm talking about the notes and the chords and the quality of the music, it's just bad because modern culture generally doesn't produce objectively beautiful music. It produces music that's enjoyable for some people, subjectively. But modern music does not have this sacred quality. When you hear, like, old Renaissance choral music, you perceive the sacred quality. What is that? Well, what that really is, is that is your soul recognizing the transcendent quality of the objectively beautiful music. But our modern culture has lost any sense of the transcendent, and that even influences the church. That influences the music of the church, because, like I said, the church has lost any notion of objective beauty. So that's why new Christian music that gets produced ends up being bad in terms of its quality. And like I say, 
contemporary music isn't bad because it's contemporary. It's bad because it's bad. Like, I know people are always going to say, oh, well, the traditional music was contemporary once it was written. Yeah, I know. The problem isn't because it's contemporary. The problem is because it's bad, because one of the problems of our contemporary culture is it has lost all sense of objective goodness, truth, and beauty. And because of that, modern people and modern society just doesn't produce anything that's objectively good, true, or beautiful. Like, it's, it's funny, people will criticize the Dark Ages, but then go traveling across Europe to see what the Dark Ages built. I'm not saying we need to go back to the good old days. I always get annoyed when people say that, because we can't go back to the good old days, because we're not in those times. We're in a, we're in a different time right now. But what we can do is recognize what the good old days were right about. I'm using the term good old days sarcastically. There were a lot of problems with the Middle Ages, but one thing they didn't have a problem with was recognizing objective goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's why people in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Baroque era um, created stuff that's far more beautiful than anyone in the modern era can even fathom. And it's not because that era was better overall. It's just because they had a sense of the transcendentals. They believed that music has the inherent power in and of itself to connect you to God, to connect you to the divine. Because it's like this, this Platonist idea of raising your mind up to the heavenly realities. That's what music, and that's what really anything that's beautiful does. Because, like I said, objective goodness, truth, and beauty is rooted in God's nature. Those are the transcendentals. And what does transcendental mean? It means it transcends the physical universe. It means we can perceive it through the physical universe. Of course, we perceive artistic beauty through light, and we perceive musical beauty through sound waves. And also, we perceive truth through, like, you know, books that are written about things. But these transcendentals, these goodness, truth, and beauty, these are things that are real, but they're not physical. Like, music itself is real, and musical beauty is real, but it's not physical. That's why, like, atheists are like, um, okay, I can't believe in God because I can't see God. Well, everyone believes in things that are not physical. Truth is real. Everyone admits truth is real, but truth isn't a physical object. What is truth made of? What is the molecular structure of truth? There is no such thing. And that's why I think math also points to God, because mathematical facts are things that are absolutely real. Nobody can question whether math is real, but it's not physical. So goodness, truth, and beauty, all these things are real. Most atheists, even if they won't admit it, believe in goodness. Most atheists, if they won't, even if they won't admit it, believe in truth. And that's why atheists keep trying to attack religion, because they say, oh, religion isn't true. Okay, but what is truth? If you're saying religion isn't true, you're admitting there is such a thing as truth. And truth can only come from a transcendental source, which we would call God. That's why I think the arguing for God from the transcendentals is the best argument for God that no one has ever been able to refute. And you can use goodness, truth, and beauty to argue for God, but I think um, mathematical truth is the best way to argue for God. But mathematical arguments can logically convince people for God, so that's why math is great. But not everyone can necessarily understand that. If you want to give people just an instinctive sense that God exists, just show them some beautiful music. There is no way to explain musical beauty without God. I mean, I, I want to say that. People do have explanations for it. But it instinctively shows people the beauty and majesty of God to listen to beautiful music. And like I say, if there is any place where beautiful music must be present, it must be the church. Traditionally speaking, everyone associated church with beauty. Everyone associated church with beautiful music, with beautiful stained glass, with uh, beautiful stone designs, with upward pointing steeples. The church used to be synonymous with beauty, and I think it's a horrible spiritual crime that many modern churches, particularly modern evangelical churches, have disconnected the church from objective beauty. And it's caused a lot of Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christians to say, oh, Protestantism doesn't believe in beauty. Protestant churches are, are ugly. And some evangelical Protestants to agree with that and saying like, yeah, the church doesn't need to be beautiful. What really matters is your personal relationship with God. No one said your personal relationship with God does not matter. But the church being a place of objective beauty creates a spiritually friendly environment that raises our minds up to the heavenly realities of God 
so that can greater facilitate a relationship with God. It's not that you need a beautiful church to have a relationship with God. It's not that you need beautiful music to have a relationship with God, but it sure helps. I know stories of people who have literally converted by listening to hymns. It's true, music has spiritual power. But even if, beyond simply just converting people from not being Christian to being Christian, music has the objectively pa objective power to nourish us. A music professor at my university, who is a Christian actually, she said, beauty feeds the soul. And that's something that has stuck with me ever since. Beauty does indeed feed the soul. Because I know modern culture doesn't believe in the soul, and tragically this has impacted the church. So many in the church, they think the soul only takes care of consciousness, but, but that's it. But yeah, like I said, we are all endowed with a rational soul that can objectively perceive goodness, truth, and beauty. And because of that, it is important for beauty to feed the soul. So it's very important for the church, which is the place of soul feeding, the hospital for wretched sinners like you and me, it's very important for the church to be a place of objective beauty. So that's why music is important, but why does it have power? I think that beautiful music has the power to convince people of things. And this is my favorite example. So my heritage is Lithuanian. So just because of my heritage, and I understand if you have a different heritage, you would have different nationalistic loyalties. Because of my Lithuanian heritage, I am inclined to not support Russian patriotism. But there is some Russian patriotic music that is so objectively beautiful that when I'm listening to it in the moment, it almost convinces me to be a Russian nationalist. Like when I hear the song God Save the Tsar, the national anthem of Tsarist uh, Imperial Russia, it makes me filled with Russian pride despite the fact that I'm not naturally inclined to do that. So the problem with contemporary Christian music is the only people who enjoy it are people who already agree with the message of the contemporary worship music. Like, you will never see an atheist or any sort of non-Christian listening to contemporary worship music because they enjoy it. Because the only beauty in the contemporary music is the subjective beauty experienced by people who already agree with the message. However, traditional Christian music is widely enjoyed by non-Christians because the beauty of it is just objective. I went to the most secular atheist high school you could imagine, and the school choir still regularly sang things like Handel's Messiah and even other just traditional Christian hymns because they were written with such an objectively beautiful quality that everyone was forced to admit it's the best music there is. Look, even a lot of the Jewish chorus people that I knew, because I'm in the music world, they still admit, yeah, the best music ever written came from the church. Objective beauty has the power to convince people of things they don't already believe because it forces them outside of themselves. When you look at a beautiful starry sky or a beautiful sunset, you stop thinking about yourself and just begin to ponder something outside of yourself, something greater than you. What that does is that really carries you outside of yourself. And that's really important because our culture is completely self-centered. We have so many like advertisements everywhere. You probably saw an ad before watching this video, and that's my fault. I monetize my videos, but I don't ever ask for any donations, so deal with it. But um, you probably saw an ad before this video, and ads are all about appealing to you. Ads try to appeal to you. Everything in this culture is about you, 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 self-love, self-care. Well, what objective beauty does is objective beauty takes you outside yourself and causes you to appreciate something beyond yourself, something greater than yourself. And that is what our culture really lacks. I think maybe that's one of the reasons our culture doesn't like objective beauty, because objective beauty actually challenges self-centeredness. And music also challenges self-centeredness. I know the exception to that is violinists whose ego is higher than the moon. Um, <laughs> Um, like, I'm, I'm a violist, so naturally I, I poke fun at violinists, but that will never make up for all the systemic oppression that violists face in the orchestra. So this is just me um, using some uh, social justice to get back at the violinist oppressors. My, my girlfriend is a violinist. She probably won't be happy hearing me say this, but, you know, she's an oppressor, so it doesn't... I'm kidding. Okay, I got completely off topic. I do that a lot. My point is... Of course, you could use goodness, truth, and beauty for selfish gain. You could use truth 
to inflate your ego. I've seen that all the time on like Instagram theology pages. And I can't pretend that I've never been tempted to do that either. And you could use goodness to inflate your ego. There's a lot of holier than thou. And you could use beauty to inflate your ego. You could pride yourself on being like the best painter, the best um, artist, the best this, the best that. I admit that. But even so, generally speaking, goodness, truth, and beauty takes you outside of yourself and leaves you in awe. But then if you're in awe, the question that you naturally ask yourself is in awe of what? Who do I thank for this beautiful sunset? Now, you could think just the random chance that the sunset happened to be arranged in this particular way at this particular time, but intuitively, we know that's completely silly. Instinctively, at, in the deepest pits of our souls, we all know that there is a God and that God made this universe. Some people live in denial of it. So Romans 1 says everyone knows that God exists. So there are no legitimate atheists, but I'll admit that the knowledge that God exists for many people is more of a subconscious knowledge. I'm not, I'm not claiming that they're actively lying, but our souls know things that we don't consciously sometimes. You know what Socrates taught? Um, Socrates believed that if you're trying to teach someone something, you need to assume that they already know it, and then teaching it to them is just getting them to remember it for themselves. That's why the Socratic method of teaching from Socrates is all about asking people questions to help them arrive at the answer themselves. And I think that's absolutely brilliant, and that's true. Because what is that based on? That's based on this classic idea that the human soul already has access to objective goodness, truth, and beauty, so teaching people is just helping them to recognize that. Because if you believe in the human soul, that makes perfect sense. The reason modern people, the reason modern education is so stupid and so horrible and it causes people to hate learning instead of being in awe of what God has created. Sorry, I'm passionate about that. But seriously, modern education, it sucks. We need to fix it. Jordan Cooper has talked about that a lot. Um, he's a great Lutheran theologian who I've learned so much from. You guys should all check out his channel. Um... I really hope to do some sort of conversation with him sometime. But yeah, the reason modern education has committed so many crimes against humanity is because it denies the notion of, like, the human soul. And learning things is tr basically training factory workers, training people to just memorize and regurgitate information rather than teaching people why any of this information actually matters. Classically, learning stuff, learning stuff was about recognizing the objective truth that that points you to. And if you go deep enough into objective truth, you will arrive at God. And that is what classic learning does, and that is what classical music was meant to do, to raise our minds up to the heavenly realities of God. That is why music has such special power, and that is why our churches need to be places of beautiful music so people can have a powerful encounter with God. But I want to be cautious here. Our churches must not be centered around experientialism. I think a lot of the seeker-sensitive movement uh, did that, and it was good intentions. It's like the seeker-sensitive movement, the goal was just to convert people, and of course we want people to have a relationship with Jesus, but what they did was counterproductive because what they fell into was experientialism, where you focus on people's subjective experience. But the, again, that's all about the self-centered experience of something and people focusing on their own experience and their own enjoyment of worship. But what we really need to do is talk more about the objective beauty that we subjectively experience. And if you show people objective beauty, they still will have the subjective experience of it, but the worship you do and the way you do the music is not centered around people's subjective experience of it. It's centered around the objective beauty in and of itself, which people will subjectively experience. All right, that's enough for today's rant. Um, I usually talk about more nerdy theology topics, but seriously, music is theology, so I guess I'm just doing what I've always been doing. So I'm going to speed this up while I finish building my organs, so I'll see you guys later. Bye.